Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. I'll just introduce myself. My name is Jay Lickus. I'm the marketing coordinator for Benavia. I've been with us four years and uh, I actually came out of retirement to go to work for them because they're such a wonderful organization. And I'm sure everybody on this call would agree the same way. It's just an amazing place. Um, it's such a good feeling every day to go home with a happy story and helping so many people. Before we get started, I'd like to do a little, uh, little housekeeping. And you could probably, it'll come up on your screen here real quick. But um, like I said, I'm your host. And today's topic is improving communication with the loved one in memory care. And we have our guest expert speakers, Carrie Lopez from Royal Oaks Retirement Community, and Ms. Jeannie Grates from Inspira at Arrowhead. I'm sure you guys are gonna be completely enamored with everything they have to say today. They are marvelous people and wonderful, wonderful partners of Benavia. But before we get started, I know we've had a few questions about it already. Um, we were talking about some housekeeping tips. And if you look in your lower left corner, most of you in the lower left corner, you'll have a little box like this, a black box with mute and video. So um, if you wanna speak, you just click on the mute button and it'll unmute you. If it has a line through it, that means we cannot hear you. And that's the same for video. So all I can ask is that you uh, be nice to everybody out there. If you've got barking dogs or your neighbors are trying to break in and you don't realize it, just uh, keep it you know, on mute so we can hear the speakers and any other questions that go on. Um, same for your video. Um, if it's on, you will see your picture and you'll see everybody's pictures. If you have the video turned off, all we will see is a black screen. Or if you have a profile picture, we will see that. Um, periodically during the presentation, we will break for questions. And you can do several things. One, you can raise your hand and I'll be looking. I'll be kind of the moderator in the background looking for everybody raising their hands. Or... If you look down, there's a reaction button you will see. And if you click on it, there's a little icon, like a raised hand. You can raise your hand that way. Or there's a chat box. There's a little button on the bottom. It says chat box. Or on your screen where the three little uh, bubbles are, you can click on that and you'll see chat box and you can get to the chat box that way. So you can write your question if you want us to go back a little bit later and answer it for you. Then um, also, if you're on your video in the upper right hand corner again, you'll see the get, you'll see a little black box and it'll either say gallery or speaker view. If you have it on gallery, you'll see everybody on this meeting and all their shining faces. If you click on speaker, only the person talking, you'll see a yellow box come around the screen and you'll see the person talking and it'll kind of take over the entire screen. So. I don't recommend that when I'm talking because my face is, you know, scared a lot of people. So um, gallery is probably the best to do so. But just so you know, when everything's said and done today, we're done with our presentation and questions. Um, I am recording this. So I will have a copy of this presentation and also the PowerPoint presentation that we go through. And I will post those on YouTube. And once they're up on YouTube and edited, I will send everybody an email with the link to that. So you'll have both one, this presentation, and two, the PowerPoint that Carrie and Jeannie will be using. So if you don't see that in the next couple of days, just give me a little shout, an email, or give me a call. I'll make sure you get it because sometimes it winds up in your spam folder because it'll be uh, you know probably about one megabyte of data. So it may direct it to your spam. So be on the lookout though. And we'll have additional information from both uh, Jeannie and Carrie as well when I send that. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the floor over to our expert partners, Jeannie Grates and Carrie. And you guys, if you wanna, or you gals, if you want to uh, give a little introduction about yourselves, let people know where you're at, who you're with, where you came from and why you enjoy being in the senior industry so much. All right, very good. Why don't you go first? You want me to go first? Yep. All right. Well, Jay, thank you so much for that presentation or that introduction. I am Carrie Lopez and I am with Royal Oaks Retirement Community. 
Jeannie and I both have been in the industry for quite a while, and I currently work at Royal Oaks in the independent living part of Royal Oaks. However, I also work with the assisted living and the memory care. The, what brought me into the senior living had to do with a little bit of a personal story. My grandmother had Alzheimer's, my great grandmother had Alzheimer's, and I remember as a very little girl, um, about four years old, going and visiting my great grandmother in her retirement community. It was not a community. It was truly a nursing home. And I remember very distinctively the sounds, the smells, and everything about it. And I knew as I got older that that was not something that I ever wanted another family member to go through. As a, a wife of a fire captain in Peoria, he would come home and tell me all the wonderful stories about what he's done with his life at work and the the life that he's changing and I would come home from work and not really make a difference. So I wanted to make a difference. And so that's a little bit about what brought me into the senior living. I love what I do. I love working with seniors and I especially have a passion for people with memory impairment because of what we've been through with my family. Jeannie, share a little bit about you. Thank you. My name is Jeannie Grates and I am uh, proud to work uh, at Inspira Arrowhead. We are a 62 and over independent living, assisted living and memory care community. I love serving our older adults, learning their story and walking this journey with them. Our residents that are in our memory care unit are the most special and the most delightful of all. And I am proud, uh, just as Carrie is, to have earned our CDP license, which is a Certified Dementia Practitioner license, which means that we've gone through coursework to take the time to walk the walk and feel and see and hear what it might be like to suffer from dementia at the varying degrees of the progression of this disease. So once I, I too have been uh, in this uh, industry for um, a good handful of years, probably half as many as, as Carrie, but we work very closely together as an industry, as partners, we both uh, support Benavia and their efforts and their wonderful programming. And we just wanna be a resource to everybody on this call that we can to help you better understand what's happening to your loved one and how you can best cope and, and navigate through this part of your life. Wonderful, thank you. So Jay, if you wouldn't mind starting the presentation and then we will jump into it. Thank you. So our hope today is to be able to share a little bit of the information that we have gained over our years of experience. And as Jeannie said, we are both certified dementia practitioners. With that information that we have gathered, we are hoping to be able to share our information with you so that we can help you through this journey and give you a little bit of hope. We recognize that this is a, a journey that no one would sign up for. It's a tough journey, and yet there is hope on the horizon. Uh, Jay, if you go to the next slide please. So let's start off with a little bit of the statistics. This slide shows us some of the startling statistics that come from the Alzheimer's Association. As we know, more than 6 million people are now living with Alzheimer's and other dementias. What to me is pretty startling is the project projection is that more than double that number, 13 million people will be living with dementia in 2050. That is a, a pretty startling number. One in nine people ages 65 and older, that's 13, 11.3% has Alzheimer's or other dementias. As I get a little bit closer and a little bit closer to that age, that just becomes younger and younger. And then more than 11 million Americans provide unpaid care 
for people with Alzheimer's. And that's where you come in. As a society, we see dementia as a reactive disease where other diseases such as breast cancer, heart disease, um, and, and other diseases are a more proactive disease. And why do I say that? Other diseases are decreasing. If you look at this chart, it talks about the other diseases that are seeing a decrease. We see heart disease had a 7.3% decrease from 2000 to 2019, where Alzheimer's has seen an increase of 145% in that same time frame. So that is pretty startling numbers to, to me specifically, especially with the family history that I have but also with the people that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in my community. What does this mean to you as an unpaid caregiver? Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Jay, if you could go to the next slide, please. So who are these unpaid caregivers? These are you, the family members, the friends, these are the statistics to list that it's one in three caregivers are age 65 and older. About a third is 65 and older. Two thirds are women, specifically the daughters. Most, 66%, live with the person that has the disease. And then a fourth is considered that sandwich generation meaning that they're not only caring for an aging parent or a loved one, but also they have children at home under the age of 18. That puts a lot of stress on a family. So when, we look in, when we're looking at providing resources, keep this in mind. And next slide, please, Jeannie. So from a basic perspective, Dementia is this umbrella whereby Alzheimer's is just one subset of a disease, a dementia disease, and it is the most common. So we do hear about Alzheimer's probably more often than not. But as an overall disease, it is a, it's a disease of the brain. So if you want to think about the bookshelf on the left side where um, someone who is aging normally like you or I, we, we have all of our books uh, on those shelves. But someone with dementia may reflect more often than not the bookshelf on the right. And the most important part to understand of this, this picture is that the top bookshelves contain our memories and our understanding and our ability to process data and facts. And, and putting things together in an order or learning new things. Whereas the books at the bottom of the bookshelf, those most represent how we feel. So when someone is suffering from dementia, the books on the top shelves are the first to go. So you'll often recognize that someone may not remember how to uh, you know, sequence a strand of numbers or put sentences clearly together because those books on that top shelf on those top shelves have fallen off. But down at the bottom, the feelings will remain with the person, emotions, uh, desires, and that's why we often see um, people, you know, that suffer from the disease seek some of the pleasures of life, like, you know, sugar and, and things that we all enjoy um, when we don't have dementia, they seek those, those sorts of things that make them feel good. So I wanted to, to share, and I don't have a slide on this, so Jay, you can leave this slide up. I thought it was important to just highlight a few things to help all of us remember what is normal brain aging versus what is what might be showing signs and symptoms of of Alzheimer's or dementia. So in the normal aging category, 
someone might sometimes have trouble finding the right word. I think we all have experienced that. I sure have. But an early sign and symptom of dementia might be someone having problems with new problems and words in speaking or writing. They just can't get them sorted in the right order or they just never can find all the right words in the right order. Someone with normal aging of the brain might misplace something from time to time. They're able to retrace their steps to find them. So I know when I leave my keys or my phone somewhere and I'm frustrated as I'll get out, but I'll retrace the rooms that I've been and I'm able to find those keys. Someone with early dementia, they're not gonna be able to retrace those steps. And every now and then we all make a bad decision. And that's normal. But what isn't normal is a decrease, decreased or poor judgment. So an example of that might be someone, you start seeing your loved one donate lots of money on the phone, you know, or that's probably, you know, more susceptible to scams and things because they have a decreased ability to have those logical thoughts any longer. So another uh, normal aging sign might be uh, sometimes feeling weary of work and family and social obligations. But someone with early stages of dementia might completely withdraw from work or, or any social activities. So an, a couple more examples. Um, Sometimes forgetting names or appointments, but remembering later, that's normal. But someone who has early signs of dementia, their memory loss disrupts their entire daily life. Occasionally, someone with normal aging might make errors in their checkbook. Someone with dementia probably finds challenges in planning or solving any problems. Someone with normal brain aging might need a little help using the settings on their television or their microwave or to record a, a show. Someone with early dementia might experience difficulty completing tasks that are even familiar to them at home, at work, or leisure. Being confused about the day of the week but recalling it later, that's okay, that's normal. But someone with dementia is most likely very confused throughout their entire day about what time it is, where they are, what year it is, what date it is. And then vision changes is the last sign I'll share. Um, most of us uh, may need some cataracts and our, our eyes sadly decline as time goes on. But someone with dementia actually has trouble understanding any visual images and spatial relationships. So there was an example once of, of someone who was a little further on the disease that there was a dark oval type uh, rug in, in front of the bathroom. And, and someone with dementia, they, they showed this piece where this person thought they were going to fall into a hole. They didn't realize that it was a flat rug but thought it was a three-dimensional hole in the, in the ground. Go ahead, Jay, and let's move to the next, uh, the next slide. So I think if there's anything that I, I personally would love for all of you to take away, and this is something that when I've gone through um, this training, is to really realize that your loved one may not remember what you've said, but they will remember how you make them feel. And you might be experiencing this if, if you're you know, trying to reiterate, uh, maybe they have a doctor's appointment and they've asked you five times in the day, when are we going, what time is it, and so on. If you're gentle and, and lovingly remind them they're going to remember that you're gentle and loving. But if you argue or scold or you come off frustrated, they're not going to remember the next day anything about that conversation, but they're going to remember how you make them feel when they, when they look in your eyes. 
Go ahead, next slide. Go ahead, Carrie. Thank you. So there's <clears throat> there's a whole lot of, of what Jeannie you just shared that plays into into play here on this slide when it comes to the physical and other changes. So most people think that um, memory impairment or any kind of dementia is about forgetfulness. It is far more than just forgetfulness. It is these physical changes that are happening in the brain. Now, all of these changes don't happen to everyone. Some of them happen to some people. Many of them happen to many of them. And some of them may not happen to any of them. It might be hit and miss, and they come in different stages. It's, there is no rhyme or reason on how these changes happen because of what's happening in the brain. It could be um, every single person is different. The, the changes in the brain is unique for every single person with memory impairment. And that is really important to understand that what your loved one is going through is gonna be quite different than what someone else's loved one is going through. That doesn't mean they don't have it or that, that your journey is any um, less important. So let's talk about some of these physical changes. Um, the executive functioning, that's one of the very first signs that you will notice when your loved one is going through memory impairment. And that is the thing that Janie talked about not understanding simple tasks like um, baking a cake, something they have done their whole life, or even just getting out a bowl of cereal. So the steps that it takes to be able to get a bowl of cereal, get the milk out of the, the refrigerator, get a bowl out of the refrigerator, then get a spoon out of the cupboard, go to the, the table, what goes in next? Do they put in the cereal next, then the milk, and then sit down and either have a blessing or not have a blessing, whatever is their habit, then eat, and then do that all backwards. Put the dirty dishes in the either the sink or in the dishwasher. Then where does the milk go? Where does the cereal go? As things start to deteriorate, you will find the milk being put in the cupboard or even in the dishwasher. You will find the dirty dishes being put in the cupboard. You will find the spoons being put in the garbage. You will find the milk being poured in the garbage as opposed to being in the bowl. It's about this executive functioning of not understanding what goes where and in what order. Not being able to do step one, step two, step three, step four. The things that we take for granted, something as simple as brushing our teeth. If you stop and think about how many steps it takes to brush our teeth, it's a lot of steps, but we do it by rote. But when the brain starts to get damaged, it's no longer something that can be done by habit. It takes thought and that thought process gets damaged. And so just Keep that in mind. Um, that inability to recognize danger, that inability of recognizing that if you walk outside and it's 110 degrees outside and you don't have shoes on, what is going to happen to your feet? People with memory impairment don't have the, always have the ability to know that they must have covers on their feet or they are gonna have blisters. So it's those kinds of things, not understanding that if there's a hot stove and the, those coils are red, that if you touch it, you're going to be burned. Or if you turn the hot water on on, a, on your sink and you put your hand under it, it's, you're going to be burned. Those are the kinds of things that we have learned through our lifetime that your brain no longer allows you to remember those dangers. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this inability to recognize danger and then piggyback on what Jeannie said about what you say and how you say it and the way they remember it. I was in a community, um, this was several years ago, it was a memory care community. And there was this beautiful lady that I had this fabulous relationship with and she was sitting there, she had no shoes on, and all of a sudden she got up and went outside. We had this beautiful courtyard, 
is she went outside and all of a sudden I realized that this is summertime in Arizona that she had no shoes on. And I was young in the industry, didn't really know what I was doing. And I go running after her and go charging out there. And I grabbed her and I said, come in, come in. You got to hurry. You got to hurry. You're going to burn your feet. And my anxiety and my excitement scared her. And the more I got excited, the more I charged after her, the more afraid she was and the faster she ran from me. And I learned a very powerful lesson that day because I finally did get her in without any blisters on her feet, but it took me months to rebuild the relationship that I had because I scared her because of the way I approached her. She didn't remember what I had said. She didn't know that I was trying to keep her out of danger. All she knew is that I came at her instead of just calmly going to her, guiding her back inside. I could have accomplished the same thing by just taking a deep breath and just, just quietly guiding her back inside. But instead, I went at her and just almost attacked her just in my effort to try to keep her out of danger. Um, filter damage. The amygdala is right here in the front of your brain. And I'm not going to give you any kind of a brain um, lesson today. I'm not qualified to, and I would really mess it up. But what I will tell you is this amygdala is where all that co colorful language resides. And it is the last part of the brain that is damaged when they have dementia. So you're going to hear some pretty colorful language and there's not one thing that the person can do about it. That is what happens with the brain when the brain has been damaged and when they have dementia. My great grandmother was the sweetest, nicest, church going, lovely lady. Um, had never raised her voice in all her life. She raised five children, four boys and one daughter. And everybody just loved her. She was so sweet. Well, then dementia set in. And grandma started talking like a trucker. And she could outcuss anybody ever. And the changes that she went through, nobody understood. And back then, this was in the early, late 60s, early 70s. No one knew anything about Alzheimer's. Nobody knew anything about dementia. All they knew is my sweet grandma could cuss like no one's business. And we now know that the, the, the disease had damaged her brain to the point where she was no longer herself. And I now kind of laugh about what had happened. It wasn't a laughing uh, matter back then, but if I was to go back and do it now, I would laugh with grandma. I had this one resident, her name was Frances. And Frances was a lot like my grandma, had gone to church her whole life. She wore a cross that just signified her love of, of God. And she used to tell me how much she loved God. And every time she would see me, and I apologize for the word I'm going to use, but it, it makes a point. Every time I'd walk in to see her, she would just kind of giggle and she'd say, hello, jackass. And I would just start to laugh because it just seemed so inappropriate coming from her mouth but it made me giggle. And so she would say that to me and then I would laugh and then she would laugh and that just became my name. Um, so every time she would see me, that's what she would call me. And yet then she'd go, I've never cussed before in my life. Somehow her brain would recognize that that was a bad word, but yet over the time that became a word of endearment, I guess, because that's all she ever called me. So you are going to find all kinds of words that come out of their mouth because of this, um, this filter damage. Uh, hearing is another part of the body that gets completely messed up. And oftentimes, people that can't hear well are thought to have dementia. So if you are having any kind of hard of hearing issues, the first thing I would recommend is get you hear, your ears checked to make sure you have proper hearing aids because if you can't hear, your brain can't function. 
if you have good hearing aids and you're still having problems with your brain functioning, then you know you might have some memory impairment. But they do go hand in hand. You've got to be able to hear or your brain shuts down. So hearing starts to go, but sometimes they go together. That makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about the eyesight. So Jeannie started talking about some of the things that they start to see, like the rug that they think is a, is a hole in the ground. Um, they see, they'll see a, some kind of a statue or something off, off to the side. They think it's a person. So there's all kinds of things that happen. But there's also this eyesight that happens as the disease progresses where, and I don't know how much you can see of me, but our eyesight is out here where we can see our hands off to the side and we can see all the way out. Young kids can see all the way out. They have a really big peripheral view. As the disease progresses, the peripheral view becomes more and more narrow. And why this is important is because when you have more progressed disease, you can only see what is exactly in front of you. So if you'll ever notice someone that is has memory impairment and you sit them down to eat, they can only see what's right in front of them and they cannot see right directly down in front of themselves. It's like they have goggles on. That's like, right. It's like they have goggles on. So yeah. if you put goggles on and look down, you can only see right in front, right in front of you, but not directly in front of you like within the first five inches. So oftentimes what you will see, especially in like a memory care community, you'll have Mr. Jones sitting facing Mr. Thomas. And all of a sudden, Mr. Jones reaches out and grabs Mr. Thomas's coffee cup. Well, Mr. Thomas now is upset because Mr. Jones has grabbed his coffee cup. Well, the reason he did that is because he can't see his own coffee cup. It's too close to him. So he reaches out and grabs the thing that he can see, which is Mr. Thomas's coffee cup. So put your goggles on and see what they can see. And then you'll know where to place the coffee cup so that Mr. Jones can drink his own coffee and not his neighbors in front of him or even your own. So being able to see that. And as we go into the next slide, this eyesight really plays into it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, balance is huge. As our hearing starts to go, our balance starts to go. As our eyesight starts to go, our balance starts to go. Just try putting your eyesight, and I have to take my glasses off or I will smear them, but try doing this and then putting something, some cotton in your ears and try walking and then putting a little bit of rocks or something in your shoes and see how much balance you have. I promise you, you're gonna fall. I've tried it. I did. And that's what they're dealing with is because as their brain starts to change, it changes their hearing, their eyesight, their feet. They can't touch things. And so then their balance starts to go. That's why they fall. You could be holding on to someone and they will still fall even if you're holding on to them. Everything, this, this brain change changes their entire body, everything. I have my glasses back on, I can't see. Um, bl bladder and bowel control. This is a natural function that their body will do, but it, there's no longer a signal that's going from their body to their brain that is saying, I have this sensation, but I recognize what that sensation is. And so they no longer can recognize that signal and that's why they lose control and then there's this whole another issue with men who have this sensation but they don't recognize where to go so men start using any kind of receptacle that they can find whether it's a plant whether it is your really nice couch whether it is the kitchen garbage can or outside it doesn't matter what it is. They just find any circular or not even circular receptacle and they will use it. That is just a natural response. Almost every man goes through it. 
So just recognize as it becomes very difficult, this is what happens with dementia. And it's just frustrating, very, very frustrating. And then finally, in this section, recognizing and expressing pain. They're going to have pain, but they don't know how to recognize what they're feeling, and they most definitely don't know how to express it. Most of this is because they have spent their whole life, as we all have, communicating verbally. And now those verbal words don't mean anything. Those are symbols. The words that I'm using right now are symbols. Those symbols have now left them. And now they don't know how to express what they're feeling. And so it's a matter, and we're gonna talk about this, it's a matter of using a different way of communicating. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then as we get into the late stages of dementia, the other physical changes, they, they stop even understanding how to breathe and how to swallow. That is why this disease is so incredibly difficult. One of the, one of the statistics, this disease kills more than bre breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. And it's simply because we're not catching it soon enough. That is why I say this is a reactive disease and not a proactive disease. We are not catching it in its early stages. Um, next slide, please. Okay, if you could go to the next slide. There we go. Sorry. There. I knew you were trying because I saw the check mark. <laughs> so now how do now that we know about all these changes, how do we go from this verbal to nonverbal? Because eventually that's what's going to happen. As I said, we've spent our whole life communicating verbally. We start from the time we are just an ought. And our parents are saying, say mommy, say daddy, say kitty, say doggy. We are learned to communicate in a verbal word world. And now we go to this place with this disease where we lose all of the words. and We are no longer able to verbally communicate, whether it's pain or whether it's trying to get them to understand how to eat or whatever it is that they're trying to communicate. So he, this is how we're going to do it. It's about moving from this verbal to nonverbal world. First and foremost, we need to be able to get within their line of vision. Remember, their line of vision, regardless of where they're at in the disease process, is going from here to here. So it's moving in and in and in. So we need to get in front of them. We need to be able to talk with them face to face, eye to eye. And it's also important that before we do that, we get their attention so that we don't startle them. So touch their shoulder, move them around to the side. So remember the hearing is going. So you don't wanna just sneak up on them. So you wanna touch their shoulder, move around to the front. If you, um, you wanna get their permission to get within their space so that you can talk with them. You wanna use very exaggerated hand motions. And it goes back to actually communicating with things. So you, would you like something to eat? So you start talking to them about eating. Would you like something to eat? Would you like to read a book? Would you like to go for a walk? So you use the words, but you also use hand motions so that they can understand what you're saying. And as you talk to them with your hands and with your mouth, then they learn to trust you. But it's about touching. It's about using your hands. Use, touch them and use hand motions. And when you're walking with them, never just grab their arm and walk with them. 
they feel more unstable if you are grabbing their arm and walking with them because they feel, first of all, it's taken away their dignity. That's the way their parent would grab them and walk with them. By using hand under hand, by grabbing your hand, going underneath their arm, and then holding this, kind of hard to do it by yourself, and then holding their hands like this, as you can see in this one picture, what that is doing is it helps them to feel safe and it stabilizes them so that when they are unstable, you have a better chance of keeping them upright. This is all about safety. It's all about keeping them safe, but it's also about helping them to know that they are loved and that they are heard. So this is all about the physical piece of it. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the emotional pieces of it. Um, next slide, Jeannie. And Carrie, um, before we move on as well, uh, that same hand under hand can be helped um, come in handy when you're helping someone to feed themselves. Again, back to the dignis, dignity and yes. part. You don't want to feed them like a child from your spoon. You want to have your hand under theirs and help them feed themselves. It makes a huge difference. So oh, you can do that. That's a, a great point. Thank you for reminding me of that. So it's the same with whether you're using the hand under hand to help them feed themselves or Correct. brush their teeth or comb their hair. It, it's everything about helping them to do what they can do. You're helping them with your hand do what they can do. Rather than, can you even imagine what it would feel like if somebody else is trying to brush your teeth? But if you put the toothbrush in their hand and then you guided their hand to try to brush their teeth, it's all about dignity. It's 100% about dignity. Thank you, Jeannie, for reminding me about that. Go ahead, Jay, to the next slide. So as we've been saying all along, uh, next slide, I think you're going backwards, my friend. There sure. It's so important that we understand that we need to step into their world Sadly, they will never be able to come back to ours. And so no amount of arguing, convincing, reasoning is going to change the fact that they just cannot make those connections. So for us to maintain our health and our peace of mind and level the frustration, you know, down a few notches, if we can just understand that we need to step into their world and approach them from the place that they're coming from. I too have a couple stories I wanna share real quick. Uh, Carrie reminded me of some interesting things and these might be some good tools to help you. So say you're in public and, and um, you're in a restaurant and uh, it's your, your father that's suffering from dementia and he's, old school and so used to always paying that bill, but he's really in no position to do that. Give him the dignity of maybe a fake wallet with some fake money. Um, we did that at one of our communities. We had a gentleman that wouldn't eat. He just wouldn't eat in our dining room because he would get so frustrated because he wanted to pay the bill. So we provided him with a wallet. The caregiver would give it to him before she'd walk him down to the dining room and put some play money in it. And he was happy with, after that point of every meal, he would feel like he was paying. Something else that um, uh, I remember well, one of our executive directors was sharing that it was very difficult to get this one gentleman to, to shower. And he just didn't want to shower and they'd go days and days without showering. And looking back at the notes that many communities like mine and Carrie take about the history and experiences and as many details as we can about the people that we serve. After pouring through the, those notes, they discovered that this gentleman was a very successful businessman. So they put up a calendar in his bathroom wall and the caregiver would point to this calendar and say, Mr. Smith, you have a meeting at 10 a.m. You have a meeting. You need to shower and get ready for that meeting. Lo and behold, 
Never had a problem showering him ever again. So it's these little things that we need to draw on to step into their world back into some of their older memories because they retain those older memories. Just like with music, I'll never forget, uh, it was 4th of July and we had a musician at one of the communities, one of our memory care communities. And the, the room was full of people that couldn't tell you what day it is, what their name was, where they were, but they knew word for word, every patriotic song. I was dancing with one of the residents. She and I had a ball and I just will never forget the joy I felt watching these, these wonderful people remember to sing these songs. And I just can't emphasize enough how much music from the days when they were had a healthy brain uh, would mean to them. And it might help calm, calm them. So if you're at home and you have a situation and play some of their favorite music and take them out of their, their pain and their frustration and, and maybe sing along with some of the songs that were familiar and made them happy. Go ahead and you can uh, go to the next slide, Carrie. So I think um, one of the things that has always been helpful for me to remember is from here on out, assume, and I know that I know what assume means, mm -hmm. um, but assume that everything that happens from this point on is disease driven. Let go of past issues. And trust me, I know how hard this is, especially in families. Um, as my father asks me over and over and over, Carrie Lynn, when are you kids leaving? Carrie Lynn, when are you kids leaving? Carrie Lynn, when are you kids leaving? I, I like you, sometimes get a little frustrated and, and remember that I have to remind myself that he's asking not because he's being my father that has always tried to annoy me, but because there's a disease there that's causing these issues. So if you can just remember that regardless of what was in the past, your loved one does not have the ability to be manipulative at this point. There's no ability to do that anymore and never argue, never, ever, ever argue. That is a, um, that, that's a, that's a battle you're not gonna win. So we had this one resident and I asked her one morning, I said, so how'd you sleep last night? And she said, oh, I slept great. And she said, she went on to tell me about the flight that she had. She was out flying this airplane and she just went all over well, I had a choice. I could either tell her that she had never flown a, pl a plane in her life, or I could just simply say, well, tell me about your flight. And so she went on to tell me where she went and what she did. And from that point on, I said, well, next time, will you take me with you? And we had a great flight. So when your loved one tells you that that wall is purple, when you know darn well that it's red, let it be purple. See the world through their eyes because it's an argument you are not going to win regardless of what the truth is. Who do you become? With this disease, unfortunately, you stop being that person, whether it's a spouse or a daughter or a son or a niece you start becoming someone else. And sometimes it's just simply that person. My grandmother, I told you about my great grandmother who became this ornery, snotty little lady. And my great grandmother just was not nice at all. Well, unfortunately my grandmother also got Alzheimer's. And because of what, they, what my grandparents went through with my great grandmother, my grandfather vowed that he was gonna take care of grandma no matter what, well, he did. Well, my grandmother did not do what my grandma, great grandma did. She became or stayed just as sweet as can be, except to one person. 
And that was the one person who loved her more than anyone. And that was grandpa. So grandpa became that man. Grandma loved everyone and was sweet as can be. But grandpa, every time she would see him, she would just call him that man. Well, why was that? It was because that man was trying to keep her safe. He was the one that put locks on the door so that she couldn't go out wandering around trying to find her dog that had died 10 years before. He was the one that would just ask her, ask her, and then get a little frustrated and say, damn it, mother, just take your medication. He always called her mother. And those are the things that happen. And so grandpa became that man to her. And it was sad to me that after 50 years of marriage, he became that man. So you become, unfortunately, that man. The stories they tell, oh my, the stories they tell. They tell some amazing stories. Whether they're true or not, it doesn't matter. It's just the story. Enjoy the story. Go in the story and enjoy it. Whatever that story might be, ask them about it and let them fly. Let them be whoever they want to be, whether it's an astronaut or a firefighter or a doctor or it, whether they tell you that they're scuba diving, whatever they are doing, even though you know it's preposterous and there is no way they were doing it, go with them. Enjoy the journey. Now you will have possibly, not all of you, but some of you may end up with some hallucinations. And those hallucinations are real to them. It's not going to do you any good to tell them that they're not there. What you need to do is ask them about their hallucination and then tell them that you heard them and that you will take care of it. You need to, they need to know that you heard them that you will validate it and that you will take care of it. And once you do that, then you will build that trust with them and they will be able to feel safe. But until then, they will always feel afraid. I'm so sorry. I, I'm sure you can hear that. It's outside the window. Um, most importantly is humor. When, this is a journey that if you can remember that don't lose your humor. If you can laugh at re, no matter what's going on, then you can truly enjoy the, the journey. If you can't find humor in it, then it's going to be a long, hard row. It's just like when Frances would call me a jackass. If the first time she said that, if I got offended, and walked away and stormed off, she and I would not have had such a wonderful time together. But I have such fond memories of her. And now every time I hear that word, I actually laugh because I remember her. And it's not an offensive word to me anymore. I just think it is such a, an endearing description. So now all my friends will call me, <laughs> will call me a jackass and I think that's okay. So learn to laugh, learn to laugh at at the things that are going on so that when you laugh, they will laugh with you. If you, if you only cry, then they're gonna cry with you. Next. And along those lines, um, I just want everybody to know that you're truly not alone. And clearly by reaching out and wanting to learn as much as you can about the disease, how to cope, how to communicate, just know that you're not alone. Dementia does not have to define the person. Just like someone who might have cancer, that cancer doesn't define that person. Dementia does not define the person. And I just want you to really know that someone with dementia can still have quality of life, whether it be from your care and your support or that from Benavia and all the amazing things they do to bring joy to their, their uh, participants, just like Carrie and I do in our communities. We have so many engaging activities and so many fun things to do to give them joy. So please know that it is possible to still have joy. 
And the part about not being alone, you can see here on this slide, there are, there are places to turn. There's Benavia, that's the best place to start. Alzheimer's Association, Arion Aging, they all have 24 hour helplines, which is really, really a wonderful thing. I'm currently working with Banner Alzheimer's Institute on helping Glendale to earn its dementia friendly status. Surprise already has earned that designation. They've held memory cafes at the Salvation Army uh, before COVID hit and they've gone virtual. I'm now in the process of working with Banner Alzheimer's Institute to create those same resources uh, here in Glendale. So if you want any more information on that, you can reach out to either Banner Alzheimer's Institute or myself to find out how you can become more involved and volunteer and seek help when it comes to living with uh, dementia. Next slide. So sort of to wrap it up a little bit, as far as what all of our options are, Benavia has an amazing day program. That's probably best suited for people who are in the earlier stages of the disease, where they can still um, understand that they're enjoying their day. And that allows you, the caregiver, time for yourself. Please do not discount your health. Do not discount the fact that you're allowed to be happy. You're allowed to find joy. It's okay to take time out for yourself. You have errands to run and chores to do and get a manicure and go to a movie. It's okay. And Benavie has programs um, to help you take care of yourself because you're not any good to yourself or anyone else if you avoid that. Uh, so there are other options. Uh, there's quite a few in-home uh, health agencies that can come in and give you that break as well. And where Carrie and I work, we actually are able to offer 24 hours, seven days a week, secure memory care um, housing. And again, we know how to prepare meals for people who are in those later stages, as Carrie was saying, towards the end of the disease, a lot of people forget how to swallow and to chew. And so we are experienced in that our chefs and our kitchens will start to prepare the, the meals either in a mechanical form, which means chopped very finely. And then they also know how to puree and still puree each dish, each part of the meal, and uh, still have it appealing in a present, present, presentable way. And I've, I've seen it, it's, it's, it's again about dignity. So we can definitely offer that. And then there's support groups. I know uh, Benavia has support groups. Some of the other organizations on the previous slide that I mentioned uh, definitely um, also offer support groups. There's no shame in saying, hey, this is what I'm going through and having someone else understand that they're going through something similarly goes a long way. The next slide, Carrie. So I think one of the, before we get to our, our questions, I, I think it's important to mention, please do not hold yourselves to promises made to each other when you're both healthy. No one really understands what this disease will do to you until you're in the middle of it. And you have to let safety be your guide. So if you've made promises to each other when you're both healthy and you are not able to keep those promises, understand that those are promises that you could not understand what you were making while you were in the middle of it. And the way I like to look at it is if you were dealing with someone with a heart disease you would never make a promise that said, I would not get you the help that you need if you, if you needed it. You would give them whatever help that they needed. That's what we do. There's, a, there's some kind of a, a belief that dementia is different. Dementia is not different. It's a brain disease. And we have to start recognizing that. If you are not healthy, then everything falls apart. The statistic that we did not talk about is what happens to the healthy, the caregiver. 
There is statistics to tell us that the caregiver, particularly if it's a husband and a wife, the caregiver is the one that we lose before we lose the person with dementia. And there's a reason for that. It's because you are dealing with all the stress, you're dealing with the whole household now, and you are dealing with all of your health issues as well. The person with dementia, they get into a, a place where they're no longer stressed. They get into what I think of as a happy spot. They know something's going on, but they are not, they're not carrying the weight of the world on them. You are. So please don't carry the weight of the world. Try to find a way to take care of yourself or you're not gonna be around to even be a spouse to them or a daughter or a son. So with that, Jay, next slide, please. The one thing I just would like to leave with you, the one thing I have learned over the years that I've been doing this is that you can enjoy the journey. This has been one of the most amazing journeys that I have been on, whether it's been with, with what I've learned from my great grandmother or from my grandmother or what I'm going through with my father or what I've learned from each and every one of the residents that I have walked with. This is an amazing journey. It's not an easy journey, but it is an amazing journey and you can enjoy it. It is one that is while none of us would pick it, it is one that can be an enjoyable journey. I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, we can either do it by raising your hand or putting it into the chat. Jay, turn it over to you. You're on mute. Even, even the guy who's on Zoom all day forgets to unmute himself. But um, we do have some questions coming through on chat. And um, the first one is from Linda Gomez. And she's asking if your loved one is in a care facility and you only are allowed short visits, how much input should you ask for? Um, Linda, I think I need some clarification. What do you mean by input? Go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. Um, well, my mother is in a care facility. Right now, we're only allowed an hour because of the CDC guidelines, uh, one, three times a week. But, but I sometimes get frustrated more not with my mother as I am with where she is. They, they moved all of the memory care patients into the general public when the um, COVID situation began because they were more easy, they had more people that they could take care of them. And um, I, I'm not sure that exactly where my mother is in all of the steps at this point, but she definitely turned for the worse in October of this last year. And I think basically because of her change of venue. But what I don't know is how involved do I have a right to be? If I go into, for instance, you were talking about hearing, they've lost her hearing aid three times. How do you, how do you have those conversations with places that you would expect would already know how to take care of that without becoming a nuisance, I guess? Well, and, and Jeannie, I, you, you're welcome to jump in, but one of the things that I will tell you is it is incredibly difficult to keep track of things like hearing aids when it's someone with dementia. And the main reason is, is because they will give them away, throw them away, eat them. Um, they, they, those things can be incredibly challenging when dealing with somebody with memory impairment. Um, so knowing how frustrating that must be for a family member, my question, if I was sitting in your shoes, would be to ask them what would what is their their policy or their procedure for trying to keep track of it? Because knowing that a resident would most likely they they could be throw she could be throwing them away. Mm -hmm. um, it happens 
all the time. But you have a right at, to know what's going on with your mom. You have a right to, you should be getting, um, I don't, is she in Arizona or is she in, you're in, you're in Illinois right now? Iowa. Iowa. I knew it started with an I. Um, yeah. I don't know what their regulations are there. Is that where she's at? She's living here in Iowa, yes. Okay, so I don't know what their regulations are, but you should be getting uh, quarterly reviews. Are you getting any kind of reviews with them? We do monthly. Okay. So I mean, as I far would as just... a group of people, I don't actually go over there because of they're still restricting visitation, but, but we do have an on over the phone type conference call with the nutritionist and they go through weight loss and those kinds of things. And I do bring up some of those things on those calls, but I'd I just- rec I would recommend contacting the director of, of the memory care unit and maybe uh, suggesting a, uh, a Zoom call because I know our memory care director will do personal Zoom calls as visits with families. And they don't just talk about, you know, they will talk about those clinical aspects, but they talk, I overhear them and our nursing team saying, you know, uh, Rick had a good day today. He listened to music. He really enjoyed it when we did the gardening. Um, mm -hmm. You could bring some more of his favorite CDs because he's enjoying the, the bluegrass. And, you know, yes. I, it boils down to just trying to have a relationship with the people that are, are caring for your parents. But I so appreciate you acknowledging that it's it's never good if you overstep and you're so involved and we see this a lot where every minute of the day and we couldn't possibly serve everybody you know by having but i think a regular communication i'm concerned about the amount of time that you're being restricted our company is very conservative and our resident families are allowed to stay as long as they want well this has all so, happened since covid um, yeah, prior to right. that, I, I was over there when, when we first moved, or I was there much of the day, every day. And that well, wasn't... This it was, state, is this the state's regulation right now? Because being in a different state, the state might be requiring yeah. it. Yes, they're, it, they're still reading through the CDC guidelines. And I go online and read them again, because sometimes I don't know if they're interpreting them right. But again, I don't want to overstep my boundaries and create a problem for her in any way. And um, I go as frequently as we're allowed, but for right now, and I know they are trying to work through things. And I know like a lot of places, they there is less staff. But the other issue when I was listening to your conversation is that my mom um, already was is considered blind. So not only does she lose her hearing, but she can't see anyway, even oh. if she were well. And so you were talking about how small that space must be. Well, for her, it's even smaller. And oh. I... And so I feel funny, but I do it anyway. I look up television shows and say, can you turn that the TV onto that channel so that she has Perfect. something? And she loves the CD. She's got all her CDs sitting there, but she can't get them into the CD player. So I try to just call ahead and say, okay, mom's having a bad morning. Can you turn on the CD player and put Perfect. on whatever? Perfect. Is that too much or? No, no. Okay. Absolutely not. And depending okay. on your means as well, some people have opted for having an additional caregiver from an agency come in and spend some quality one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, and I know that's an expense, but you know, if it, if you're able to, you may want to consider looking into one of those um, home health agencies that can spend an, a couple hours a day just bringing a little joy to her one-on-one -on -one because yeah. you're going to get one-on-one -on -one in any community setting. Right. And that's, I've asked that question, um, especially for if I'm, I can be there every day. I'm only 15 minutes away and I don't mind that, but I, I'm not given that choice. And so I did ask about that. I said, what about a caregiver? Could you give, or could you let me hire one of the girls? Right. We do. Time, you know, and let them do that. I, not yet. 
they are, they've never done that before is what I get. And it's like, well, maybe you need to think about it because they, I do recognize that they need, and there are, there are a number of folks that are in the same situation because they were moved out of the gardens and now they're in meadows with everybody else. So there's a, uh, it need, it almost needs to be separated again. Well, but, and, uh, and feel free to, you know, email your executive director, maybe some of the yeah. things that you yeah some answers to because we never really want to recommend moving someone especially if they're that far along in the disease mm -hmm. it's not ever a good option to move them if you at all you know can keep them in their environment because yeah but well, it's not a bad it's not a bad environment i don't want to give that feeling but i, I just understand I think there's a lot going on for all all of us i guess and i just wanted to be sure that i was within my rights to go a little further than I yes do. okay thank you Linda, that was some some great information I'm sure everybody's had issues like that themselves um, we have another question here from Sandra and she asks could you expand natural aging versus dementia the first was on finding the right words I didn't quite get to differentiation Well, Carrie, you were talking a little bit about keeping keeping the language and the direction and the and the verbal part of the communication simple. And that that's I don't know if that's kind of answering that question. Um, do you want to speak up a little bit and give me an example of what what you're really trying to get to? Me or Sandra? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sandra. Okay, when you were first going over the guidelines for um, what's natural aging versus dementia, the very right. first one you brought up was, um, oh, come on, kick my brain in. <laughs> it's okay, I'll find it. Forgetting, sometimes forgetting names or appointments, but remembering later is normal, but memory loss that disrupts daily life, um, that that was the first one is that you no know, the very I, I believe the very first one you talked about was when they're not when they're having trouble finding the right words and and you said that's part of normal aging not being able to find the right word and then you went on to the description for those that have dementia and i didn't understand to me they sounded almost identical so i didn't understand how you would recognize the difference in that one point does that make Jenny, sense you want me to make this? well yeah, go ahead, Carrie, if you want to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so Sandra, let me see if I can explain the difference. So the, the difference between those of us that just cannot come up with that word is we'll, we'll be replaying in our head that conversation. And I was trying to think of, oh gosh, what, what you know, ice bucket. Now I, I know ice bucket, I know what it is, but I can't come up with it. And so later at night, I come up with that word ice bucket. Someone with dementia, that conversation never even pops back in their head. So they're going through and they're trying to come up with ice bucket, but they're gonna come up with lamp or they're gonna just say, you know, that that thing, 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 thing. You know, that thing, 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 thing. So they, they can't come up with the word and then it, they move on and they never ever go back to it. So it just never, it never even comes into their head again. They don't even recognize, or they just start replacing the word with things like thing, 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 thing. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. It's just identifying that someone that you've been communicating with all the time and hasn't had a real problem with maybe writing out a check you know, spelling their name, but all of a sudden they can't complete their entire name on the bottom of a check. That's the sign that that could be a symptom of early dementia. And one thing I want to bring out is that it may also be, it could be a medication. It could be a, a UTI back infection. Yep. It could be dehydration. Um, so we might have temporary things that cause this kind of cognitive disruption. So I don't know about you, but I have experienced those things. 
and I'm 60 and I've experienced them as young as 54, 53. So just because you've experienced them doesn't mean it's a permanent situation. So there is such a thing as temporary memory impairment. You get your body well, whether it's getting off the medication that's causing the, the fog. It could have been because you were, you were under some kind of anesthetic and then you get that anesthesia out of you. And then you can get back to um, your full function. See, I was trying to find the word. So <laughs> hopefully that helps. It does, thank you both. You're welcome. Thank you, Sandra. If anybody else has questions, go ahead and take yourself off mute, raise your hand, or just use the little reaction button. Um, while I'm waiting for everyone to ask their questions, we had one more question that was direct, sent to me. Um, what, what do you do if your loved one becomes physically combative? Ooh, great question. That is very, very much a great question. Jeannie, you want me to take it? Sure. Uh, yeah, and I'll try. Where do you want to take it? Well, you know, essentially anything that you can do to redirect, you need to understand what is causing this, this reaction. So we have a gentleman that's farther along in the disease right now, and he just, anytime one of the caregivers tries to assist him to get dressed or take a shower, he punches and kicks. And so early on in that, we were able to have his medications adjusted to just give him more calm, but it's to the point now where in our setting, we're not in a place to be able to even help this gentleman. There's There are other types of facilities that are for behaviors that come with some people experience those later on in the dementia disease and that's a whole different environment and conversation. So I wanna to wanna to look at what triggered that behavior. Really dig deep. What did you say or do that triggered that, that, that violent behavior so that you avoid that altogether? But if it becomes unsafe for you, that's when you need to reach out to one of those resources and, and come up with a plan and a strategy as to how, you know, you have to speak to your doctor, of course, um, but it's it's time then to probably look at a safer environment for you and for, for that person. But if you can at all identify what triggered that and try to avoid that going forward, that would be my first step. What do you think, Carrie? Well, I would agree, agree but I would be uh, very cautious about staying in an unsafe situation because that's that's a dangerous situation for all involved, not just for you, but also for your loved one. I, I would be seeking some um, some help, get your neurologist involved, find out if there's some medication adjustments that can be helped. I'm not a big fan of medication, but there there's a time when medication is the right answer so that they can get into a more stable um place in their own head. So yeah, don't, don't stay in an unsafe environment. Maybe you're the trigger. Maybe you need to get out of there and see if a family member can help. Excellent, great questions. Carol, I noticed you're off mute. Did you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I'm wondering how much uh, should a person be made aware of what is their, what they are facing? Uh, my husband is still, you know, he can still comprehend and, and so forth and so on, but I don't think he has any idea of what is going to be probably happening. So, uh, you know, and, you know, when do you make that decision that they need to go into professional care? That's, that's, that's the other thing. So, well, I, first of all, I'm, I'm of the, the belief that the sooner that you start having those conversations, the better. Um, they're, those are the hardest conversations because he's most likely going to not acknowledge what's happening. There's a lot of denial 
but the more you can get him to understand that this is like heart disease, that this cancer. is like heart disease, cancer, then he, you can get him on the path to getting the help that he needs so that, and that there's no shame in this. This is not, it's not something that he did or didn't do, but then he, you can get him on the path to getting the help that he needs. So sooner and the second. And the second part of, of answering your question is when. It's truly when it becomes a safety issue. If you feel like he's going to walk out, you know, there have been people that have talked about their husband going down the street to houses and climbing in, going into some their neighbor's home and getting into their bed. And I'm not making this up. So when you start seeing some, your loved one walking and roaming the street and, and maybe getting lost and you've had to go find him or doing things like Carrie mentioned, walking outside when it's 110 out barefoot and not even knowing that it bothers you, yeah, you, know, you know, those kind of things. And, and when you see him withdrawing from the things that he normally enjoys, but it's mostly a safety issue. As long as you feel like it's safe for him to be home alone or, you know, that sharp objects aren't going to be mistaken because there are oftentimes at some point people will mistake, you know, a, 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 a butter knife for a toothbrush. Like that happens. So if you see those kind of things, then it's safety kind of is the key word. Safety and safety for him, safety for me and so forth. Because he is some combative, but he's been that way. <laughs> A lot of the way he is now, he has been. So, but, um, you know, I think that that helps some. What the neurologist doesn't really say too much. Yeah. I would say a support group is great. Talk with other people that are just like you who are walking this path. They this is a wonderful, wonderful seminar. I have to compliment you. Oh, well, if we can make anybody's day a little better, we're so happy to help. We really are. Nobody understands. <laughs> No, it's it's okay. hard to understand. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for letting me. Just so everybody knows too, before we go on to our next question, that when I send a follow-up email out to everybody on the call, we will oh. also have Jeannie's and Carrie's contact information, so you can reach out to them directly with oh. any questions you have. So, um, sure. Maya, did you have a question? I noticed you. Yes. Uh, yes, you're, do. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, thank you, Jay and and Jeannie and Carrie. This. It's just what I needed because I am uh, just new here for a little over a year, just before COVID started with my 93 year old mom. I have a little separate place about two minutes away and she's showing a lot of signs, but um, I'm, she's staying safe. But I was just uh, to kind of go along with what Carol is saying, when, when does she ever get diagnosed or helped in any way do we just keep playing along like everything is fine she knows she's she calls it aging and she's so glad i've taken over this and that and that i'm helping but when is that point where i know my stepfather um who died from from dementia he had medications like when do those kinds of things start well that's the first place you start is with your physician Okay, and they have, the, you know, those doctors, even though they don't have the same sort of caring and compassion and support that, that we can direct you to, they will go through an assessment very much like mm -hmm. she does that with, with her doctor. So he'll be able to see a pattern of, of when it's becoming more confusing to her. So as long as she's safe, and it sounds like she's complying and going with going with your direction, as long as that continues to be a safe and amicable situation, you know, I, I don't, I just think you have to be mindful of it and know when to really seek a next step. Yeah, she's still driving and, and um, those the are minute she gets lost. Yeah, you know, that's what I say, like when you got lost, did you get, feel afraid? And did, what did you do, you know? And it sounds like she did pretty pretty good and it's her independence. I think she's got another few months that maybe she can do that. But I don't know if I'm being crazy unsafe about this or. So so one of the things, um, Maya, is it Maya or Maya? Maya. 
Maya, one of the things is um, age is going to play in here. Because your mom is 93, they most likely are not going to go to the next step. Um, the chances of her being referred to a neurologist are pretty slim because of uh -huh. her age. Okay. So it's going to, uh -huh. it's going to fall onto your shoulders. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is if you start seeing the fact that she is getting lost or the fact that she is no longer in a safe environment. That is when it's going to be up to you to then make those decisions. The doctors most likely are not going to recommend you having her see a neurologist simply because of her age. If she was 83, that would be different. 93, it's rare that you'll see a 93-year-old being referred to a neurologist. So along the way, if I were to notice that things have gotten to a point where I really just can't look out for her, like she she's having too many accidents with her bowels and it's getting very difficult for her to clean it up and I'm not there all the time, then I would go to start looking for a place. That is correct. I would go to my doctor. That's right. And you would just work with your primary care physician for the admission orders to that next step. Thank you so much. You're right. I just have really felt alone and, and this has been very helpful. Thanks. Yes, you're quite welcome. Thank you, Maya. Are there any more questions? Don't be bashful. This is an interactive workshop. Wow. May I? Can, can you hear me? Crystal? I'm Diane. Okay. Yes. In answer to a lot of the questions, because I'm at a point where my husband is in an adult uh, care home, and uh, I've been through all the steps that you're talking about. And uh, I think your, that your advice on when it becomes unsafe. With my husband, he had other uh, back problems that were uh, congenital. And so uh, he got so that he couldn't, uh, that he fell down twice, a Friday and a Saturday. And you know, he and I had to have the paramedics come because I can't, I'm not capable of, you know, lifting, lifting him up. And so what I'm saying, the second time I thought he's unsafe. I'm unsafe. This isn't fair to him. Luckily, he never broke a bone, but it's not fair for him to fall like that. So I had to seek, uh, you know, professional care for him. And uh, he also had pneumonia, by the way, and that he was weak from that. And I didn't know it. And so long story short, the unsafe rule that people are talking about is very important because I, you know, I could deal with the dementia and I did, but, and it, it was getting, it's getting severe, but uh, it was that, that un physical unsafeness that, you know, right. and then a whole bunch of other things that I didn't even realize. There's things that you don't even realize, such as he has to have a thickening agent because it's affected his swallowing. So his water, coffee. See, I had no idea that existed in my world. That wasn't a thing. So I'm, I would just say to the women, I, I know having walked in your shoes, uh, you do the very best that you can, but the unsafe. And when the time does come, don't be afraid because his life has improved immensely. And so has mine. And we both can sleep at night. And oh, that's a lovely. Diane, thank you for sharing that. One of the things that I always think of is it, it this allows you to be his wife and not his caregiver. And so now from here on out, you can hold his hand and love him and not have to do all of those things that you were doing day in and day out that you just didn't need to be doing. That is true. Good choice. Uh, Chris Steinberg, you have your hand up. Yes, I did. Um, mine is more of like a practical question. I know we're not supposed to argue. I know that we're not supposed to reason. <clears throat> but how, when you're trying to solve a problem for them and try to get details so that you could help, is there better ways to ask questions to get to underlying answers? Is That's this with a parent? It's my mom, yes. <laughs> Jump overboard. It's done, right? 
Well, it, it's so is your parent living with you or is she living, she or he living alone? It, it's my mom and she lives directly next door to me. We have a 10 foot section of the block wall taken out between both houses so she can come and go between both houses. And she's fairly functional. It's just she doesn't necessarily believe that she's got memory loss all the time. She's trying to convince me that it's getting better, that she's just going through a little something right now. Um, like one example is yesterday she told me she couldn't go outside because they told her there was going to be smoke from the Tonto fire. And I was trying to get her to go outside to sit in the sun and just enjoy herself. And it's sort of like I'm her best advocate, but it's always somebody else that tells her not to do something and she'll, she'll like abide by it. And I'm trying to figure out if there a way for me to help her understand that I am truly her advocate and I want the best for her and that the news people are not necessarily telling her the truth or the wind shifted direction. And guess what? The smoke in our area. So you might have to get a little creative here. So you may have to, rather than using a direct approach of just saying, hey mom, the the news, the, the wind changed, the newscasters are wrong or whatever, you may have to put it aside, agree with her, yep, mom, you're right. And then come back five minutes later and say, let's go look at, I need your help. Let's go look at these flowers. So use her as your, I need your help. And rather than come with me um, and let's do this because it's for your best good, you get her to help you do something, whether it's to water the flowers or whether it's to uh, carry something or whatever it is. If you can get her to help you, she's more likely to do it rather than to tell her to do something. Okay, that makes sense because I know she's always wanting to help and I've never been somebody to need help. So probably that's a lesson that I have to learn to give her back that dignity part of her life where she can't help me since she can't pay her bills, she can't drive anywhere. So find out ways to, that she could help me that ultimately gets what I think is best for her. That's right, she wants a purpose in life. Okay. So rather than having her daughter tell her what to do, if you, get, if you told her she, that you need her help, she'll be dancing on. Oh, you froze. We lost. She's dancing on a table right now. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific questions, um, Kim Taylor. I see you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I just have one question about the legal issue. Uh, my mother's ninety-one, and she was doing really well until she had surgery about um, eight months ago. And after the surgery, she came home and has been in kind of a state of confusion ever since and has been uh, diagnosed with major neural something, uh, cognitive, major impairment cognitive. probably. You what? Probably impairment is what Yes. And uh, she's still very sharp. We play games and she can figure things out. Uh, but I don't know, she wants to be able to drive. The doctors told her she can't drive until she goes down and have a, has a driving test. My question is, if she goes down and has a driving test and they pass her, which I'm sure they will, because she can, she can do things still, but if she was to have an accident and it's on her record that she has this dementia, can they come back and sue her for everything she has? Yes, they can. Yeah. And so you need to make sure that you have all of your power powers of attorney in place too. I do. Durable power, mental health of power, and medical powers of attorney. So that's I great. Got all those. So you're all set up for that. You just need to I remember when my grandpa was in his nineties and, and he didn't have uh, dementia, but he was bound to determine at age ninety four he was gonna drive. And so money was a big deal to him. And so I remember my aunt and uncle appealing to him on, daddy, if you go out and you get in an accident, you know, how are you gonna feel if they take everything out of your bank account? 
How is that going to make you feel? And they just were able to identify that one thing that triggered that, that emotion. Um, so if she's early on, she may understand the cause and effect. How would you feel if you accidentally, you know, ran over a child? Why don't we make some other arrangements? Let's go together in an Uber, mom. You so know, my sister and I live close to her and we take her every, she hasn't driven for a year now. That's good. Uh, so, and, um, but she, she wants to be able to drive. And so we keep well, on telling her. Sometimes is a good idea. people have disconnected the wires in the car and just said, you know what, we've got to get it to the repair shop. Sorry, we just haven't had a minute to get your car repaired. And I know that's tricky, but you have to use some of these. I, what do we call it, Carrie? It's we're not being deceiving and lying, but therapeutic. Therapeutic, fibs, therapeutic right. lies. fibs. Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. And and we have to come up with those and and not feel bad about them. Now, she just said to me, take me out for a drive and see how I do. I have no issue. With, she's a beautiful wonderful lady and i i think she could drive perfectly well until she gets into one of these situations where she gets confused and doesn't know where she's going and then there's the problem and she doesn't understand the difference between those and she's sitting right here <laughs> well you, you know her? what you just tell her that she deserves to be driving miss daisy yeah we we deserve to be chauffeured <laughs> And you are chauffeuring her because she's earned it all these years. And you are, it, it would make you so happy if she would let you be her personal chauffeur. Yeah. Yeah. What about that, Mom? <laughs> you deserve it, Mom. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed the webinar today. Terrific. Wonderful. Wonderful questions, too. Very poignant, very powerful. Um, they always said, some wise person told me way back in the, in the day that make sure you always ask a question because everybody else on the call is afraid to ask that same question. So, terrific stuff. And anything else before we wrap up here? I know we're running a little bit long, but I just want to make sure everybody got their chance. Um, any final words, Jeannie or Carrie? No? Oh, don't give us time to give final words. We'll be here for another hour. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I just want to thank everybody on the behalf of Benavia for being here this afternoon and joining us. We are going to take a little time off this and we will have our next uh, workshop, educational workshop on August 11th. It's called Understanding Grief in Mourning. So you'll see it on our website, benavia.org. Like I said, I'll follow up with an email to everybody with the presentation, the PowerPoint, and additional information from both Jeannie and Carrie. And please don't be bashful. Feel free to send us questions. I will forward them on. And, uh, you know, like, I don't know who said it earlier, but if, if you want to start somewhere, uh, give Benavia a call. We'll find an answer for you. And we have the, the partners and the resources like Jeannie and Carrie and Sylvia there that, that will help you out. So you're not alone out there. That being said, thank you so much. Um, you. Enjoy the rest of the week. And uh, stay healthy. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.